Good day, Ajay. First of all, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. I appreciate it. And of course, it is Skype, so we can expect some maybe technological issues, but hopefully not. I, uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with you, Guy. Well, thank you. Yes, I, that's why I bring that up is because I, <laughs> I, I do experience those uh, technology issues. And it's not always operator error. Sometimes it's just something you can't help. But uh, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and then tell us where you grew up and where you went to college, et cetera? Okay. Um, boy, you said you only had an hour, right? Okay, yeah. so let's work, let's work with that. Uh, so my name is Ajay uh, Pangarkar, and uh, many people know me as sort of the uh, uh, business guy or the business side of learning and development. And so uh, I uh, actually, as you know, Guy, I'm based in Canada, actually specifically Ottawa, Canada, the, uh, the capital of our nation. And uh, been, I grew up in Canada. However, what, what people don't know is I was born in the U.S. and raised for the first year, first couple of years of my life in D.C. until my parents moved us back to Canada. Um, growing up here has been interesting, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, where I did my education, actually, uh, and it's, 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 I'll try to keep this short for you, Guy. I started off in engineering because my dad was an engineer. And so I went through engineering, um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I hated every minute of it. Uh, and I was raised, my mother is French-Canadian, my father was from India, uh, but I was, whenever it was convenient for him, he'd pull out what I call his Indian culture. And I sort of had to follow in his footsteps, as you can appreciate old cultures. Uh, once I got wise enough to know that engineering wasn't for me, I decided to pursue a degree in business, uh, specifically finance and accounting, which I enjoyed tremendously. At the same time I was doing my degree in finance and accounting, um, I was working for an engineering firm, happenstance, um, as a director. And it was there that I realized managing a team in a department uh, where I got my first exposure to training and development, as they called it back then. Um, and I remember, and this is a funny story because, um, and maybe I'm going too far down a rabbit hole, but it's interesting to bring up because as a director of a staff of 25, uh, I remember, you know, HR and training coming to me and saying, you know, or actually my boss would come to me and say, send, people, send your staff to training. And this happened, you know, repeatedly. And they would come back, and back then there was not a lot of e-learning. There was no e-learning, actually. They would come back and sit in their chairs, and, and I would, you know, my budget was, my money was taken out of my budget for the training. And uh, the people came back and sat in their chairs and weren't applying any of the new skills. And I think it was by the third or fourth time that they were, I was asked to send my staff on training and I told my boss no until training can prove to me that it's going to make a difference for the money I'm spending it's going to make a difference in my performance in my department performance uh, I'm not sending them and so that was my first exposure and as I was going through school I wasn't really thinking about getting into a career in learning and development to be honest with you I was trying to get into actually investment banking to be honest, mm -hmm. <laughs> frankly um, then I went on to, uh, I left the company, I started my own consulting company, I did, uh, and I started in business training for small businesses using my, my commerce, my, my accounting background. And I enjoyed training immensely. It was, it was, just, it was a fun thing to do, and I really, uh, people got a lot out of it. So I went back to school. I went back to do a graduate diploma in adult education at uh, Concordia University in Montreal. And uh, at the same time, I did a graduate diploma also in accounting to, to get my accounting skills uh, well-rounded and uh, went out and I after I did all that I was like what am I going to do with these things like I got okay I'm doing training in business but what purpose does this adult education program serve me for somebody who has an accounting background um, oh I left out that I did my CPA designation as well so <laughs> I'm a CPA uh, by trade so I'm sitting here trying to put the pieces together and trying to figure out how, you know, it's like the old Sesame Street thing. One, one of these things doesn't fit with the other. And I realized that I got to figure out how to fit it. And funnily enough, I was, you know, starting to write for a couple of magazines at the time. And um, the whole training ROI movement started coming about at that late 90s. And I was a little perplexed about it because you know, being a finance and accounting guy and looking at this ROI stuff in training was not making any sense to me. And I sort of tried to deconstruct it, tried to figure out what they were trying to do. And so I started a bit, I guess, on a campaign of disproving why training ROI is not valid as a calculation in training and to ensure that people learning credibility would, would remain. Anyways, I'm going off the beaten path here. So uh, after that, you know, I went on and I, 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 I became, you know, very um, 
involved in the learning space. Um, my specialization actually was not necessarily learning. It was performance and performance management. And I always tell learning practitioners, performance is not the proprietary right of learning. P performance is led by the leadership of the organization because it's one of the key skills. And, and learning is just one element of performance in an organization. So that being said, I, that's where my specialty came in and, and um, started writing for a lot of publications as, as you know, a guy, you know, write for all the ma major publications in learning and development and um, on that topic. And here we are now. And I get the pleasure to talk to you. So. Well, thank you. Uh, yes. And so let's go back and explore some of this. Um, um, the, uh, you know, you put it as the ROI uh, <laughs> movement in, uh, in learning back in the late 90s. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. So um, in your statement that uh, I guess you can't measure ROI for training, is that, if I got that correctly, Go back. T talk to me a little bit more about that. Okay. So, uh, if you allow me the liberty here of using an analogy. I know it's hard to believe for a lot of people, but I was a nerd in school. And I'm trying to be a funny guy, but mm -hmm. anyways, it's failing, right? Um, <laughs> and the nerd in school is trying to fit in with the cool kids all the time. And so what we try to do is try to you know, emulate or do something that they're doing to try to fit into their crowd, but we don't use it correctly. And we fail miserably because the cool kids look at us and say, you know, you really don't get it. And basically, and this is with all affection, by the way, people think I bash L&D and I don't. I think I want to build their credibility. I'm on their side. L&D is a nerd in the schoolyard. And with the training ROI stuff, what happened is this. We wanted to fit in with the cool kids, which were business leaders, and we wanted to gain some credibility. Understandably, we, we didn't have a lot of credibility. We do something that's very esoteric, that is intangible, that is hard to prove that we had any relevance in the business. And we do. You know, We'll get to that maybe later on in the discussion. We do have an exceptional amount of relevance in the business. But from our perspective and the leader's perspective, it's, it's all air. And so when we try to use ROI which is a business and accounting and a financial concept in an environment that is not meant to use ROI. And I don't want to go down too far here because this is where it gets a little dangerous, gets a little technical. But simply, if I back up a step, learning and development is a cost center in the organization. That's not a bad thing. And as cost centers go, there's a lot of cost centers in the organization. As cost centers go, one rule in accounting, this is not my rule, anybody can look this up on generally accepted <clears throat> accounting principles or international financial reporting standards or, and, and, and the legal requirements for accounting. You do not measure return on investment on cost centers. A cost center is not meant to pursue, it, ROI is about profitability. Mm -hmm. And so we're not driven on profitability, so for that's the first fatal flaw. And when you talk to a business leader who's formally, formally educated in business, in finance and accounting, their mind, and I say this with, again, all respect to accounting and finance, we're brainwashed in school of how to calculate ROI. Sure. So it's like two people talking two different languages, right? If I come up to you, I speak French, and I come up to you, guy, and say, and start speaking to you in French, you're not going to read, you may speak, I don't know, but, you, you know, you may, <laughs> you may understand a few words, but you're not going to get what I'm saying. But you might catch on a few words and try to interpret it. And this is what we're doing here. We're drawing terms that we don't understand back at people that really understand it, mm -hmm. and we're getting it all completely wrong. And if you think that building an ROI model for learning is gaining you any credibility with your business leaders, guess what? You're probably cutting yourself off at the knees. But however, there's a, there's a, there's a nuance here, Guy. The nuance is technology. And when you get technology involved, these are what we call capital assets in finance and accounting which get measured based on ROI, but not the training itself. And, you know, again, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but I know you're probably going to ask me later what should people take away, and I'm going to repeat it again, is you need to have a little bit of business literacy here. You need to have a bit of understanding. You don't need to be an expert. You're a subject expert in learning and performance. You do not need to have a liter expertise in business, but you need to have an understanding of how to communicate in business. And that's the issue with training ROI. It's not meant... Excuse me. It's not meant to measure 
a true profitability of an activity because we're not a profit activity. Um, it's a period expense, so we can't prove it for multiple periods in the future, so we can't use it anyways. Um, and fundamentally, that's the issue. And I've written extensively about this. I've documented it. People think that it's my opinion. It is absolutely not my opinion. And I, I challenge anybody to prove me wrong, but open a damn textbook like an accounting or a finance textbook, and then prove me wrong in that, because that's where my proof is coming from. Well, thank you for all of that. I uh, This is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you, because I've read uh, some of what you post and some of your articles about, um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to know a little bit more uh, the specifics about uh, your take on the use of ROI in the LND or TND world. Um, yeah, I often think that it's being misused. And uh, you well, here's the confusion, guy. If you don't mind me please. interjecting, <clears throat> see the problem is that business leaders look at ROI in a literal sense. You know, the Dupont ROI framework. Right. They, they that's what they're brainwashing. So when you're in a business environment, automatic. Even me, when I start talking to people in business and they're talking ROI, my mind automatically goes into these calculations. But Naturally, you you and I as humans use, you know, what's the return on this investment in a term that, like, what is this going to give back to us in a non-literal sense as far as the calculation goes, meaning what is the benefit that we're going to get out right. of it? And so we have to be careful. And, and I know a couple of people that you and I both know have said to me right to my face that, oh, you're being too um, – what's the word I'm looking for? Um I can't think of it right now, but it, not too literal, but you're being too... Um, well, you're being very picky about something, but I think that it's a valid point because if you're going to go... It's not picky. If, you, if people yeah. want to get invited to the uh, to the uh, big table and they're going to be talking with people like the CFO and they want to talk... What always has bothered me is this nonsense about return on expectations, ROE. <laughs> um <laughs> Because we'll get to that, because I, I got a rant for that guy. But anyway, but uh, so that you know, so to, to me that you, you know, like oh, face palm, uh, because that's the wrong thing to say because it just shows your ignorance to people when you talk to them using their jargon, their uh, terminology with very specific, nuanced meanings, and we're throwing it around like we know what we're talking about. But yeah, so. Um, but here's here's the deal. I mean, with return on investment, again, going back to that, mm -hmm. they are expecting something from us. It's true. They're expecting right. some benefit from us. They're not expecting a financial return from us. I use this example. It's like marketing is a cost center. They're not asking mark. You know, and marketing is in the same position as us. Actually, they're well. We're a little bit behind them. But prior to algorithms in websites, uh, marketing. You know, we would put a, a multi-million dollar ad campaign. I think pick any company. Put a multi-million dollar ad campaign out there. You know, I use a Tide example. You know, you're sitting on your couch at 10 p.m. at night watching the news. A Tide commercial comes on. You didn't get, you know, you didn't jump out of your chair to run to Walmart to buy a, a box of Tide. You know, but chances are in the next day or two, if you're at Walmart, the first thing that's going to pop into your mind is that Tide, and that's going, you're going to buy it. Now, you, the marketer, hey, I had there's a there's a there's a causation there that I made that happen, but is there a true link? You can't identify that link. And business leaders know that there's no direct link between you looking at the tire commercial and buying it a week later, mm -hmm. but what they know that it had an impact. Learning is the same thing. Like if I shove something in your head today. You know, hopefully I did it well enough that you're going to apply it in your job. Um, but it, if you apply it in the next week or two or a month, I can say, yeah, I, I made an, an impact on that. I made a change in it. But can I really connect it to my training? You know, so but it, it is connected in some way. So we're in that same dilemma. But, you know, you don't they don't ask marketing to provide profit output on it. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't say the sales increase on title week later was because of that ad campaign. There is a relationship, but you can't connect it directly. So we have to be very careful with that. I agree. I agree. Whenever I've uh, uh, worked with clients who were interested in ROI or uh, return on net assets or whatever, wh whatever the bigger picture of the, that the project was involved in, I always made, made uh, allowed them to do the algorithm. 
So how do you want to calculate this? And uh, um, because they live and die by the results of their investments. So, you know, uh, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, place your strategic bets. Um, and if uh, training or learning is part of that because they see that as a necessary component to uh, an overall initiative, um, you know, we just have to, you know, so ROI to me was always about the targeting in the first place. And most training organizations, heaven forbid, should never be allowed to target their own efforts. They should be directed uh, by people who know what the top priorities of the business are. Um, so the whole notion, we get all wound up, like you say, uh, in this notion of uh, return on investment and uh, um and yeah, if we're talking to our executives, our leaders, and we're misspeaking, we're losing all credibility as soon as we start. And you know, it's funny because you talk, you're talking about the leaders, that, and, and everybody assumes that we're going to be talking to the chief, whatever. Mm -hmm. But more, more often than not, L and D talks to operational leaders, right? And so the frontline operations or whatever it may be. But these people also understand what ROI is. So we have to be careful. Now, here's the deal. Remember, I, I said I factor out technology in my example. I'm going to bring it back in. So in marketing, technology has influenced how they report back on the impact, and they can do it very well. I mean, you and I both shop on Amazon, and we know how well they track what we buy and what we do. And they can really tangibly make that correlation of, you know, the marketing and the sales and so forth. The issue here is training is in the same position. What's happening with training is that now we wish that we had technology, and we have technology. The problem is that technology is going to hold our feet to the fire as well. While it makes our lives even more interesting, it's a double-edged sword. And I wrote an article about this on elearningindustry.com just recently, about how te learning technology is a double-edged sword. If you're going to want it to facilitate and really impact learning within the organization, there's the other side of the coin, too, that now you're being tracked of what people are learning and how to apply, apply it. So if you are blaming your LMS for not tracking things properly, it's not the LMS. It's what you are tracking and what's being applied in the organization. And now your businesses are going to say, okay, we just invested X number of thousands of dollars in these learning technologies. Prove to me that you're making a difference. And that's where it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. And and people are screwing up on that one. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of learning people who don't get it. That yeah, you got a beautiful LMS, you got all these e-learning development tools, but you're still you're screwing up because the business leader is saying, "Well, we invested all this money, and I'm not seeing that direct correlation yet." You know, same way the marketing does it. So we have to be very careful here. Uh, we speak too much about learning, and we don't speak enough about performance. And I know, Guy, you spoke, speak about this and write about this quite often. Learning is the vehicle to the end result. It's not the end result itself. Right. You know, I'm in accounting and finance, right? I've created financial statements, but I don't go around running to the chief financial officer and say, hey, look at the pretty financial statement I created. They don't give a crap. What, well, the reason I created it is to show the bottom line result and to interpret the numbers within it and get it organized. Okay, so very quickly, so the technology is this, right? It's a double-edged sword. So I'm going to go back to an example. Um, so I think, I don't know if I left off on this point. Learning is the vehicle. It's not the end result. Regretfully, a lot of learning people see learning as the product. It isn't. The product is the performance output. You know, whatever I shove in somebody's head is not, you know, that's why testing to me is, is, is just not important. For me, it's application, right? The level three, level four stuff that Kirkpatrick talks about, right? It's the application. Because if I make sure that I get you to do something, Guy, and I get it to do repeatedly, and it makes your job better, it improves your productivity, ultimately improves the productivity of your organization, and it either creates savings or profitability for your organization. Either way, the company is ben benefiting by the training I put into your head. But it's not the training that, uh, that the business leader is going to be, you know, worried about. It's about what the training did to you to make you better. And so it goes back to technology. We have to keep track. The technology is about that. It's about keeping track about the output because if we're going to be waving the wand about, you know, hey, we got a great e-learning course, nobody cares about the damn e-learning course. Well, and I'm a bit strong about that. I don't mean that, you know, that direct. But 
you can build a wonderful e-learning course and be so proud of it, but if it doesn't deliver a result to make people better in their jobs, who cares? Right. Like it, at the end of the day, who cares? I mean, let's be frank. And so the point being is that the end result is improving performance in some way. Whether it is to improve profitability in the organization, improve productivity, efficiencies, whatever it may be, all these things that your, your operational leaders and business leaders are worried about, that's what you're trying to impact. That's the needle you're trying to move. And so I tell, uh, and I take, and by the way, I've taken learning development people, and I never, by the way, I never get called by L&D people. I get called by operational people to talk to L&D people. And what I've done recently, no, no word of a lie here, I've actually do what I call um, operational field trips with the learning and development people. Because what happens, they get stuck in their, in their offices in their cubicles designing courses, but they don't understand what the end user to end customer wants. And so I take, I said, get out of your cubicle. I set up a meeting with the operational leaders and the staff, and I said, we're not going to do anything there but sit there and listen to them. We're going to listen to what their pain points are, what their performance issues are, and we are going to design, reverse engineer what they said into something that works for them to make sure they can improve that needle. Because at the end of the day, I said to you when I started my career, if we're taking money out of their budgets and they want to get what they pay for, right? You go to Walmart, you buy something in a product, you know, you, I've done it before, I do it at Costco. You buy a product from Costco and you're not satisfied with it, you put it back in the bag, you go back to Costco, they don't care to give you your money back, right? Why can't the operational leader go back to you and say, hey, your training didn't work, I need my money back. And, and in all fairness, that's what really this is about. We need to understand what the customer wants and, and then build behind that to make that happen. Make sure your vehicle delivers on what they need to achieve. Can you ch- tell us what uh, what your current job is, what, uh, what you're currently working on? Because I think you just had a change, and so I'm not too sure yeah. about what that is. Okay, um, so it's been an interesting journey. So as a lot of people know, I'm a performance consultant, and um, um, one of my one of my passions is not just been around performance, it's been around costing. So um, I've done a lot of um, work in costing and cost estimating. Now people say, okay, well, what's the big deal? Well, uh, cost estimating, if people don't understand, is 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 really quite important in industry, especially in the public sector, uh, but in all of industry. So you know. In government, for example, uh, I worked with departments like the, the Defense Department on how they cost out the purchase of, you know, the joint strike fighters that were buying buying with the U.S. With the billions of dollars. But you have to think about how do you cost out buying a, a fleet of jet fighters that will last a life cycle of 30 years? Like it's it's it, it sort of blows your mind. So uh, I'm doing a lot of that. I do it with companies too. What I'm doing now is I've been called in by the government of Canada, one of their largest departments. It's called Shared Services Canada. And Shared Services Canada is basically uh, the technology infrastructure of the government of Canada uh, across the country. And our department, and I'm working as the the director of costing operations there, our department is responsible for vetting all the costs of the technology investments that are happening within the government. So a lot of departments will come to us, you know, the taxation department come to us and say, you know, we need more, you know, we need some more, we need more servers and, you know, we need about, you know, this kind of bandwidth and amount, I don't know, let's say up a number out of the area, it costs $50 million. We have to go and cost it out and understand their needs and what's their requirement. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that that role I'm in right now is temporary. I'm in it because I need to learn <clears throat> what's happening with my team in the costing operations department. My role there is actually to, um, for the next two years, is to stand up a new costing operation, pro- uh, sorry, costing processes within the department, as well as standing up a um, consistent costing operations and competency development framework within the within the department. That means making sure that all the costers in the department have a regular uh, proper acumen and a process in place that they can cost out properly, make sure that they're fully accountable for the money that the government spends to the public. Mm -hmm. And so that is going to be my, I guess, you know, I I shouldn't say this too fast, but I I see this possibly as my swan song in consulting because it's it's almost like the um, cherry on top of the sundae. It's You don't get opportunities like this all your life to be able to lead a charge almost with a blank check 
for a very prominent department for a government in Canada to put something up that could change the culture within the organization fully. So um, it's going to be a, it's going to be probably a one to three year mandate, um, and we'll see how it goes. And cross your fingers, guy. Hopefully, I'm successful. Well, very cool. Uh, before we uh, se segue into the second set of questions here, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, your book. And so I think that you've got one handy there. You want to tell, yep. tell us about this book and, you know, who it was written for and, uh, you know, why they would <laughs> want to uh, check it out? Hope you don't mind me doing that, Guy. That's it, so. It's fine. So. Um, it's called The Trainer's Bound Scorecard. And um, the book was written about, actually not going on 10 years, surprisingly, but it doesn't date. So I told you I was a performance guy. And... Um, and this is this is very important for L&D, and I need them to pay attention to what I'm saying here. A lot of L&D people tell me that learning is not important to their leaders. Myth. Lie. If you look at any survey for any organization, I think you know this guy, It come, learning and knowledge within an organization is in the top five, if not the top three, worries of leadership. And so uh, what I did is I... Years I've been writing a lot on the um, performance framework of organizations, and one area that's was lacking, and it's still to a certain extent lacking, is in the balanced scorecard, the performance framework. And this is the granddaddy of all performance frameworks in organizations. There's what we call four perspectives, and and I won't go too much in detail, but the four perspectives are finance, uh, customer, uh, internal processes, and a fourth one called learning and growth. Now. The people who created a balanced scorecard, um, Dr. David Norton and Dr. Robert Kaplan, back in 1990 with KPMG, actually back then said to business leaders at a Harvard speech that the root of your organization in the future, and this is 1990, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, the roots of your organization are going to be fundamentally entrenched in knowledge and learning within the organization. And these are two gentlemen that are have no background in learning. They're you know, financial and accounting and you know, business professionals solely. And what they were foreseeing is that if the competitive differences within the organization is not going to come from, you know, creating a, a what we used to believe is a, a nice, a new and different product. It comes from the intellectual capacity within the organization and the knowledge the organization possesses and how that influences performance within the, organ within the organization. So what they did is they put this box called learning and growth and they connected it to customer expectations, internal processes that leads to uh, the output of the financial, of all organizations, the financial output. And they said, we need to, you need to connect this. Now, where am I going with this is that after reading all their books and anything on performance management that I could get my hands on, I actually got the privilege of sitting down with Dr. David Norton. Um, I don't know about you, but my groupies are not rock stars. They're these business gurus. And actually, we had a great chat. And... Um, I said to him, I said, I'm doing research and writing around the learning growth part. And he goes, perfect. He will send me your manuscript when you're done. So I wrote a book with Wiley called this, The Trainer's Balanced Scorecard. And it, speak, it speaks to where they were lacking, how to connect the learning and growth to the rest of the organization for the strategic output. Now, funnily enough, the purpose of the book was twofold. One was to actually speak to the learning group and say, hey, you have an exceptionally important and crucial role within the organization to contribute to strategic outcomes. The secondary role was talking to business leaders because Dr. Norton told me that business leaders still don't get it. They don't understand what learning does. And so it was to speak to that connection. And so this book speaks to that. I, if, if anybody picks it up, I know, um, and I'll, I'll give this offer right out to them, right, right to you right now, to your audience. If anybody buys this book and they're perplexed, I encourage them to reach out to me. I'll be happy to have a conversation and answer any of their questions. But it's an important facet that performance is not it's part of our role, but performance is part of the organization. And the most important thing we can realize right now is that knowledge and, and people knowledge specifically is one of the most important and influential aspects within the organization. You and I can name companies right now, leaders in the market, whether it be Google, Starbucks, Toyota, uh, you know, you can continue naming some of the leading ones out there, Amazon. These companies fundamentally recognize that it's knowledge within the organization that drives their competitive difference. And they know how to translate that knowledge into performance 
uh, sorry, operational and strategic performance outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the book speaks about. And um, I hope I didn't give away the ending. The butler did it. So. Um, but, <laughs> but that's what I speak to, and I actually do cases in there. I actually have real cases in there, mm -hmm. and I actually have a fictional case where I walk people through how to do this, and um, and it's very practical. So I hope people, you know. Well, very cool. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so uh, tell us a little bit about your first exposure to what I call HPT, Human Performance Technology. Others call it Evidence-Based Practices for Performance Improvement. Others call it HPI, Human Performance Improvement. Many different names for this, though. There's the whole total quality management movement. You know, lots of people trying to do improvement. But so what was your first exposure to this world? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I guess it goes back. Well, I think it goes back to my... Um, I've always been inquisitive, even at the youngest age. I've, I've been very curious. And when I started my career, my first real career job, I wouldn't talk to other jobs before that, but my first real career job at this at this uh, engineering company, and I had that staff of 25 people. I was curious about, it was my first experience managing a team. and uh, And... You know, I think back about the mistakes I made, but it took a lot of courage for my boss to put me in that position, knowing I didn't have experience managing teams. And what my curiosity led me to is what is not necessarily about the managing people, but how to connect people to the objectives they need to do. And and I think maybe that would have been my first exposure. I didn't know it was called HPT or anything like that at the time, but I was really curious about the connection between what they know, how to do something and the output mm -hmm. and that was that was my first real curiosity factor and you know it's always been my curiosity factor about you know I always believe people are at the heart of the organization and if we don't leverage the knowledge they have in their head you don't have an organization so it's, it's something that's been very very important for me so that's probably the earliest stage that I probably can remember any type of thing something like that occurring in my life well, can you can you uh share with us any people or articles or books that were of particular interest and influence back in those early well, days? Not the, yeah, the first book, of course, I think everybody knows this one, is The Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. Uh, you know, that's the seminal, I think, you know, after what, it's 25 years now, I think, if not more? I don't 90. know. Uh, yeah, 30 years now, right? It's, it's one of those books that... At the time, nobody wrote anything like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, there was nothing that was out there that was that sort of comprehensive. Now, it was one of those books that you really had to take the time to read because, you know, Senge really wrote in depth and in significant amount of detail. But it took me a while to get through that book, but it was well worth my time. And I think that was probably my biggest influence. And I, I, I carried that book. I, I think I still have it on my shelf somewhere. But for the longest time, I would have that book in my bookshelf when I was working, and I would either refer to it or quote from it or do something from it. It was just it was that kind of influence mm -hmm. that had me. The other influence I guess I had as far as this knowledge side, and I know this is maybe debatable for some people, but is the Kirkpatrick methodology. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have my own critique about it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, I, I do like what he did. I think the simplicity, I know there's like people like Will Fallheimer are sort of, you know, pushing back on it. and But for me, and I got to meet him, and it was really pleasant to talk with uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick as, as far as his philosophy. And I even said to his face once, I said, you know, when we talked, I said, look, I said, I really like your philosophy, but I think we're doing this ass backwards. Sorry for the language. Um, I don't think we should, be, as a business person, I don't think we should be talk, talking with level one. We should be focusing on four, working backwards. That's always, always been work with the end in mind. And, you know, we should be working with four. And that way, if you work with four, working backwards and developing your solution, um, and I didn't want to insult him, right? I mean, it was, it was a, I was a young guy. Um, to me, it just made common sense that you would build a solution that fits achieving level four because the biggest complaint at the time, I remember saying this to him, is that people don't know in L&D how to get to level three and level four. They're just perplexed. So why don't we flip this? And I only wrote about it years later. But that being said, and, and, and listen, I, that was one of my big crit critiques about it, but I love the simplicity 
of moving from one step to another because in business you just need that conciseness you need that quickness mm -hmm. and that's what appealed to me a lot so those two things i probably would had a lot of influence and i would say i guess the training roi i hate to say this had an influence on in me by pursuing the disproving of it and actually what it led me to do so the good thing out of my disproving of it was I did a lot of research and thought into it before going out there because I just don't go I'm not like some people that go out and just write something because it's my opinion I need to make sure that when I go to put something out there that if somebody challenges me I'm ready and so it helped me really investigate um, what am I saying is, is what I'm saying correct or not and so those were probably the three areas that really sort of influenced me as in this in this field thank you Let's shift gears a little bit here. Uh, if uh, if you were to give us a thirty second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? And as we discussed earlier before we hit the record button, um, I would might set this up that uh, um, you're at a neighborhood party and a neighbor comes up to you and asks you what you do. So what I'm looking for here is a way to provide some examples to others in terms of how they might respond because I think some of us find it difficult in order to find some succinct response to that uh, question, you know, what do you do? With business leaders, because usually those are the people I meet, I usually say to them, I can ensure your people uh, attain your performance and strategic objectives. And what that does is, is interesting because the first thing is they think I'm in HR. And so the, I, the reason I just say it in that one sentence is because it's not, I don't want them to think that I'm in HR. I want them to be curious about what I'm saying because automatically when I say to an operational leader, I can ensure that your people, you know, will improve your performance or, you know, achieve your objectives. They'll, they'll I, you know, turn to me and go, okay, tell me how, right? And then I can get into the spiel about, you know, what do your people know? What do don't they, what don't they know? What are your performance pain points, and how are you connecting to get them there? Right. So I, I that's those are the little snippets I give to people to make them understand what I what I try to help them do. I never say I never say I'm in training. I never say I'm in learning, um, because I don't think I am. I do build courses. I do e-learning courses. I build instructional stuff. I do instructional design stuff. But I never tell them that because now I'm getting into the secret sauce. Who cares? Right. At the end of the day, nobody cares. You know, you don't go to McDonald's asking them what's in the secret. Well, maybe you do, but you don't go asking them what's in the secret sauce, or you know, you just want the Big Mac, and you want to eat the Big Mac. You don't want the cashier to tell you how it's assembled, right? Because you probably will not order a Big Mac if they told you that. So the point being is that the same thing with your client. Um, you need to appeal to what they do. So when I explain, you know, ask them. What I, when they ask me what I do, I tell them that. I, I make sure you people achieve your performance objectives, period. And they get some really curious. And so now I can, and my boss, by the way, one of my influences back early in my career was one of my first bosses. He taught me a saying that I live by to this day. And by the way, and I'm going to share this with people. If you have a spouse, it probably can help you in those arguments too, what I'm about to say. Sell them what they want to buy, not what you want to sell. Because at the end of the day, people have a problem to solve. You can't push something you want to sell. You need to sell them what they want to take from you. And so if you can identify what their need is, you'll craft a solution and you'll win that argument all the time. And so that's that's what I do. Thank you. Thank you. Let me shift uh, gears here a little bit uh, to my next question, which is, can you share with us your current focus or your next focus for learning? As a lifelong learner, you know, what What are you exploring and, and uh, attempting to learn more about? <clears throat> well, I'm a curious cat. I just love learning stuff. Um, by the way, both my parents were teachers. And um, it's funny, I, did, I, I said I would never become a teacher in my life, and I also now teach in university. I teach accounting in university, of all things. But um, one thing that I'm curious right in the learning space right now is we talked about technology, learning technologies. And... This is not my concept. This is something that Toyota has been doing for years. Um, so if people understand what Lean Six Sigma is and the Lean manufacturing process, Toyota has been a leader in that for the last 40, maybe 50 years. 
what people don't talk about, especially in Toyota, you have to really dig for this. They do something called, they don't call it, I've coined the term lean learning, but basically it's lean learning. So uh, I think the, be the best way to tell you what I'm doing and researching and learning right now and writing about is to an example. So at Toyota when, and we all know this, this is a story that goes, that they still do it today. At Toyota, the lean, one of the lean processes is that at the beginning, that was unheard of is that you would allow any factory worker on the line to shut down the line if they saw a problem. Now, we take it for granted now, but back then, 30, 40 years ago, that was unheard of. To stop a production line that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars of losing money for a company. The purpose of this was an iterative improvement process. What people don't really talk about is what Toyota did during that process. And one of the things they did during that process is that if guy, you were working on the line, and you decide you saw something was wrong, you stopped it. They didn't just go back and fix it and start the line again. They would investigate, and they would sit with you and sit with wherever that fault laid, at whatever point in time that fault was done. They would go and investigate why that happened. So go back to the Kaizen methodology, asking why. Part of asking why is learning. And, so, and then they would document these processes of not having it repeat again. Hence, they would never have really the same mistake twice. And this iteration continued, which made Toyota to this day that we recognize a company with some of the best quality products out there. This is what we call learning in that process. Now, that was 40 years ago. Fast forward to today, we have technology. We have an enormous amount of learning technology that can do this for us. I'm, I, f I took this... And I'm writing two feature articles, one for ATD, uh, TD coming out in, in June, and another one for um, trainingindustry.com, two feature articles on lean learning. What can you do to become lean in your learning process? There's just two concepts here. One is you need to be lean in how you develop learning. And second, you need to understand how to ensure that the, your learning is lean within the operational process. So people can take it. So we, you know, people talk about e-learning, but we still slap on four-hour courses or eight-hour courses in e-learning. No, we talk about things like uh, micro-learning, which really annoys the crap out of me because people think this is a new thing. But business leaders always wanted you to not interrupt their processes for any length of time. So how do you get learning very quickly into the workplace, into the workforce, so people can apply it and move on with their job? And so this is a lot of stuff I'm working on right now, and I'll be speaking. I don't want to give too much away, but I'm writing two feature articles on it. And, um, yeah, I'm, I was supposed to do, until it got canceled, Learning Solutions, I was supposed to do a session on it. Um, Next week, I guess, <laughs> that got canceled. But that's the thing. So uh, lean, the lean learning concept is something I'm really working on right now. Well, let me segue from that into uh, my question is, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Now, I, I ask this because uh, throughout our profession, our field, we have what I believe is uh, language issues. We have uh, overlapped and gapped language. We have a lot of language issues. Yes, we do. And so uh, this question in particular is intended to tease out from you a particular phrase or term that you feel is being misused or misconstrued, and you'd like to put your spin on uh, it in defining it. And if you have more than one, you uh, you know take a shot at two or three if you wish. But so, what do you have for? <laughs> well, the first one I won't spend too much time on it is uh, ROI. Um, I think it, it's, it's semantics. Somebody told me it was the word I was looking for. It's not semantics. There is a difference when I talk to to a business leader about ROI and um, the generic term of you know what are we going to get out of it. Well, you know, so that's one thing. Um, that's very important to me. And I need people to be clear in the workspace of when you talk to, especially to anybody who's handling um, projects, when you start tossing ROI, be very careful how you use it. And it's, by the way, <clears throat> and a side note, it's those formulas that were created in the ROI, the training ROI field, are invalid. There is no such thing in the financial world or accounting world that does that. And if you really want to know how to calculate ROI, it's not the ones that we calculate based to calculate our investment returns in, in the stock market. 
go look at things that your managers or business leaders are working on, things like net present value. I don't want to scare people here, but internal rates of return. Um, uh, these are, are uh, what I talk a lot about, cost, volume, profit, economic uh, value added. All these are ROI calculations that are more complex than the simplicity that, or I, and I'll be very blunt here, the stupidity that I see in the training ROI side. Um, so if you want to gain incredibly, do that. The second one I want to speak about is the word performance. While it sounds innocent enough, I think we take on, when I say we, the collective we in the learning space, we try to take ownership of that, and it's not ours to own. What people don't realize, and I don't know why learning some learning practitioners I speak to get so shocked when I say this. I say, you know, learning is an operate as a business leaders or it's a leadership an organizational role. It's something that starts with the senior leadership and moves its way down. And performance is not just about people, it's about processes. And we have to be careful of this because we own parts of it that reflect people, but it's not the only thing. So we have to be careful of how we use the term performance. We don't own it. We do have an influence over it, but we don't own it. And that's very, very important. And the last thing, I don't think it's a term guy, but the last thing I'd like to add here is, and I don't know, maybe you know it's a term, but we you need to know when to step away. We're too eager sometimes to, I always call it the pleasing the parent kind of thing. You know, we're like the middle child of the family, and we're trying to get our parents, which are the business leaders, to get their approval. So we'll jump in in any case to, to try to prove ourselves and paint ourselves in a corner. I, I said there's more courage when you can stand back and say, no, it's nothing to do with people. This is a process issue. We need to step away. Have the courage to do that. And that's something that, I don't know if there's a term for that, but that's something that irks me. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's something that's necessary too. It's the uh, being bold enough, um, assured enough to push back uh, when you can see what's obvious. Now, the late Joe Harless would have said, sure, I can help you with that training and I can help you even more if you let me do a little front-end analysis thing and where he would let it be proven or disproven that knowledge and skills were a part of the issue that needed to be addressed and what those other variables that were uh, uh, needed to be addressed were also. Okay, let's uh, let, let's go to the next question here. And we talked about this before we hit the record button. I was looking for some stories from of some of the people that are in the business. Now, they may be people that we know or we don't know. You might have a funny story, a serious story. But uh, in order to humanize some of the people that we may or may not have heard about, uh, you have some stories here of some people that you were going to, to share with us. So uh, please go ahead. I I gave you three names, and there's a couple of other names I'll give you. I didn't give you off air, but uh, I might go to. That's fine. But let, let me start with the three names. One is, um, and he's going to hate me for this. <laughs> uh, he may not. His name is Anthony Altieri. And Anthony Altieri um, is a gentleman that may not be hugely well-known, but when you get to know him, you're going to wish that you knew him sooner. He is one of probably the most practical down to earth, uh, some often self-deprecating, which he shouldn't be. Um, individuals that's genuine, and he cares about people applying XAPI. And I think this is somebody that, if you get a chance to meet him, speak to him. He's got a by the way, and I I don't normally do this for a lot of people, but he's got a great Lynda.com course on the fundamentals of XAPI, and I encourage people to go find on LinkedIn Learning or Lynda.com his course. And he really is very practical. I mean, and he's one of the few people in X, the XAPI world, and I don't want to slight it, people in XAPI world, but he's one of the few people in XAPI world that actually knows what the hell he's talking about. Um, a lot of people toss around the terminology and are very superficial about it. And I guess maybe his only fault is that sometimes he can go into weeds with it, <laughs> but fault him for that. 
that proves that he knows his stuff. So, um, but uh, a really good guy. And, and again, he'll probably hate me for, I tell you, he's a little self-deprecating, so he might hate me for mentioning his name up here. So, um, and he's fun to just to chat with about anything. You know, he's got very controversial points of view too. So cool. enjoy it. Um, the other person is a common friend that you and I have is Carl Kopp. Now, Carl, I don't have any funny stories about Carl, but I do appreciate having him as a friend and a colleague. And I'll say I give due credit where credit is due. I've done, um, I'm going to be doing, by the end of the year, I'll have done 10, 10 courses with LinkedIn Learning. And I'm not saying that to brag. It was all due to Carl because when he was the first doing his courses, uh, the people who were looking for content asked him if he could recommend anybody and he says, there's only one person that came to mind. It was me. And since then, I've been doing courses for LinkedIn Learning. And Carl is just one of these people, and I hope you, I think you agree with me on this. He's just, you know, just easy to talk to. He, you, he'll speak to you. He will never speak down to you. He'll speak to you. He'll, he'll make sure you understand something until you understand it. And um, again, just a good person. And I suggest people if you see if you're at a conference and you see Carl, tell him Ajay told 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 you to stop and talk to him. So uh, he won't mind at all. And um, one person that is probably known because of his company and his product, but not as a person himself. He speaks a lot at um, for the e learning guild. Is um, uh, Robert Gad. Robert Gad is a I can call him a dear friend. Um, we've been friends for a few years. He's built this company called On Point Digital. And the reason, and I don't normally publicize companies unless they're, unless they're paying me, and I haven't been paid by very many, so let's put that in full disclosure. And, and by the way, Robert is not paying me for anything at this point. He doesn't even know I'm doing this. But Rob is a, a guy who cares about the solution. He's knowledgeable in the area of LMS and XP, XAPI. He knows the stuff. But more importantly, when some salesperson is trying to sell you on an LMS solution or some type of learning technology solution, Rob, of course, is trying to sell a solution, but at the end of the day, he actually cares about that you get your answer. To sell, he's not going to convince you. He's going to convince you to buy it because he knows you actually need it. And Rob is, just, again, one of those guys you can have a beer with um, and just have a great conversation. So three great people that I really enjoy talking to. Um, there's also um, Mark, uh, sorry, one other guy, and I, I know I didn't mention to you, but He's a little, you know, he's a little abrupt and, and, and brazen at times, but Mark Lassoff, I don't know if you know Mark. Mark Lassoff uh, does, he does um, uh, coding, and he, do, he's, he speaks a lot in, in, in the learning space around uh, coding. And he's got a, a great, uh, slipping my mind now, but he's got a great website, but his name is Mark Lassoff. Find him on Twitter. Um, knows his stuff when it comes to coding. So if any learning professional out there, a practitioner is looking to understand coding a little bit better, you know, turn to Mark. He knows his stuff. Um, and I do have a funny story. Please. If you like. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you know Nick Floro? I know of him, yes. Okay. So Nick, get him on your show. He's fantastic. The guy is like a, you know those Swiss Army knives? He's like the Swiss Army knife of uh, hacks. I mean, the guy knows he'll give you a hack. If you don't know where to go, he'll give you find a hack for you on something on technology. He owns a great company out of, out of Philadelphia, but he go speak to him because he's just a genuine guy. But here's the funny story. So one time, I, like, this is a number of years ago, I was speaking at one, one of the conferences. And um, for the life of me, I don't know why it was in San Jose, I forgot to book a room, completely forgot to book a room. So I realized it was like, two or three days before I was leaving, and I realized that, oh, crap, I didn't book a room. So try to find a room anywhere at the last minute. It was impossible. So I'm like, oh, crap, I'm going to have to live, you know, sleep in the street with the hobo. So out of the goodness of the heart, and this is how nice Nick is, he says, no, he goes, you're going to stay with me. I'm like, okay, well, you got, you got a place there? He goes, no, no, I got a room. He goes, I got a second bed. He goes, I said, okay, I'm going to pay half for you. He goes, nope. He goes, you're just going to, you know, you know, bunk with me. He goes, not a problem. Never asked for a cent, nothing. He just genuine to, to his heart. And I said, well, you know, I sleep in a buff, so you better get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nice guy. So, uh, and I guess the last thing I want to add to this uh, for you, um, uh, Guy, is I don't know, apart from knowing somebody like Dr. David Norton, 
to a certain extent personally, I can't call him friend, but to have the privilege of talking to these business side of things, I would encourage people to look towards, if you want to become literate in any of these areas, a gentleman that just died recently that I idolize, uh, Clayton Christensen of Harvard. He He's the one who coined about 20 years ago, disruptive innovation. He's the one who coined the whole term disruption. And if you read any of Clayton Christensen's stuff, you'll be amazed. Um, going back to the 80s, people like Michael Porter, the economist and strategist, um, read about his stuff. He'll talk to you about, you know, you talk about value chains within the organization. And the reason I say that is because if you want to find how you can target your learning solutions within an organization, understand your organization's value chain. So go to Michael Porter. Um, and there's things like um, the books like Blue Ocean Strategy that speak about innovation and using knowledge in an organization to create in innovative concepts. So there's a lot of things that I read in that space that I think is very valuable for the learning, um, the learning uh, practitioners. Um, and understanding how they can contribute more to the organization. Ajay, thank you so much for uh, that and pointing to these additional resources. So as a wrap to our interview, uh, thanks again for doing this, but do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially for people new to the field, whether they're younger or middle-aged or older, but what guidance would you have for people new to the business so the first thing I would say to them is don't be so myopic in learning yes you are the subject expert and that's what you're hired for but especially if you're new in your career or even if you're mid in your career if you're so tunnel vision into just being a learning practitioner you're not doing yourself and more importantly you're not doing your organization any favors you need to be a little more, bit more of a renaissance person. You need to expand your horizons. And I get into this argument a lot with especially academics who teach in the educational technology side of things. Um, we need to, so if you want to be learning and you want to be that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Pure about it is a, is a word I'm looking for. But if you want to be that pure about learning, then work for an academic institution. Most of us who get into this space, 95% if not more of us, don't work in academia. We work in the business world. So my last, what I always say, and I coin it this way, you are work, learning, the learning function, you are working in a business function, internal business function, within a business to improve the business. Stick that into your head and then make sure you understand what that business is about. And one thing I use in my presentations is that if you don't know where to start or where to focus your learning efforts, learn your company's mission and vision. Because just like in the military, that's the ultimate goal. That's why they exist. And in that mission and vision should direct you into the areas that they want to focus. And then deconstruct that. Go to those areas in the operations and say, okay, you know, and talk to them. Get out of your office and just go talk to them. Learn about their business. Trust me, it'll make you such a more robust learning professional and you'll be seen as a valued partner. I always tell people, don't stop being reactive. You want to complain about being an order taker in your business? That's your fault. Get out of your cubicle. Go learn about the business. Become their partner. Become a proactive partner. Understand what they need to do understand what they need to improve, and then build them a solution that works for them. And again, that's it's always worked for me, and it's worked for people I've counseled. So. Ajay, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us, for, for sharing all of your wisdom and insights. Uh, thank you so much, and have a great day. Well, thank you, Guy, and I appreciate being here, and I enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you.